Chatting with a new guest, he's Gary Wagner, editor of the Gold Forecast. Gary focuses on gold and silver, the metals, and the Gold Forecast is up an astounding 222% this year. And he also beat the market by 33% in 2011, which was a difficult year in the precious metals complex. Gary, how are you today? I'm excellent. How about yourself today, Jordan? I'm doing very well. Thanks for coming on. Uh, let's get right to it and, and speak about gold first. Um, how, 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 let me ask about the short term and, and the decline that we're seeing today. Um, how, how is that impacting your analysis? Do you, do you think gold is going to take out uh, that recent low that we made, uh, I believe, uh, last month? Uh, that would be the, the 16, um, what, 65, 70 area? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, the chart that you see on the screen is is basically one of the charts that I work with. It's a daily chart. And really what I'm looking at when I take a look at this market is what's simply called an, an Elliott Wave count. And Elliott Wave is something that I use pretty aggressively. This type of chart that you're looking at is what's called a, uh, a Henkinashi, which simply means it's a Japanese average chart. The difference between this and, say, a bar chart or a candlestick chart is where a bar chart and candlestick use the four identical data points, open, low, high, and close, and form their daily or, or whatever sequence or whatever time it is. The, this type of chart that we're looking at actually takes the midpoint of the prior trading session, and by doing that, um, takes all the noise out. In other words, uh, you get a different feel for it, and that's why what you're looking at is this succession of green candles as, as it goes up. Now with that in mind, what I'm looking at is this. To just make it quite simple, we had a, a long protracted uh, correction. And that correction was really a descending top, as you can see these series of lower highs, and almost pretty much a flat bottom, as you can see from this triple bottom that we had right here, right here, and we call this the triple bottom here. Now, when, when it came to the apex, it broke out, and you can see it broke out pretty solidly. Elliott Wave technicians call this the thrust. But it was also the beginning of a new impulse cycle, meaning a major fifth. And a major fifth is going to be composed of five primary waves, one, three, and five being what's called impulse, meaning they go to the upside, they're going in the direction of the trend, and you get two that are called corrective waves. Now, the current situation that we're looking at is we are in a corrective wave two and let me kind of highlight that can you can you see what i've highlighted i've, I've yes, put it okay yeah, i'm looking at that I okay so really what we're looking at is this area right in here and that should be in, in a most uh, simplistic world composed of three waves a uh, wave a which takes us to the bottom of this line here our b which is called our counter wave and then our final C. Now the final C is going to contain the answer that you have. The market in a classic ABC correction will do one of two things. A standard zigzag will actually make a new low. In other words, you get your A, your counter wave B, and then your C. And then there's another one that's simply called a flat. And a flat is where you get equal lows. If it doesn't go to this low down here, 1665, it's called a truncated. My actual sense is that we could in fact see it truncated and that is in my bias because I am a gold bull and the only reason that I'm stating that now is because if you notice this particular long term trend line that's really our supportive level right down here, the low, do you see how it matches up perfectly to that low right now? Yes. And so. Because of that, if it breaks through this point, the next area you have to look at has to be uh, 1665, where A went to, the low of A. So right now we're at a critical level. It's come well up off the lows. I think that the low today was 90. It's trading 1697. It's still under pressure, but that low is matched perfectly. And so it really depends on how it reacts at this point because as far as our long-term chart and technical studies, it is still not broken in any way out of this bull trend that started really middle August to September um, when it came off of a 
major low, and I believe this low was right around what, just around 1600 here, coming up to what I'm calling our intermediate one here. So we've had this terrific move. When it came down, this low here is actually exactly 50% of the move. And here's another interesting thing. Uh, my subscribers know this because as soon as we went into our B-Wave, we bought at um, 1685 We bought about $20 off the uh, bottom. And what I told my subscribers is on a classic model of Elliott Wave, your B-Wave will be anywhere between 50 and 75% that of the move of your A-Wave. And as you can see here, I've kind of put this in a box. Um, the actual top, let me go ahead and erase this so you can see a little better. The actual top was about three quarters of the way through this range. This is, I put it at 76 because it's a fib number and this is 50. That's what these two lines represent. And I think it's interesting how Fibonacci seems to work so well in terms of a technical approach in the market because as you can see, this move here, that's 50% and it goes just shy of that. Now, once we had that stop in place, we were able to put in another resistance line that's a descending resistance line and once again we're going into what I like to call a compression triangle and really in a compression triangle you get a narrowing of range so you get lower highs you get higher lows when it gets to the apex that market will break it will break significantly in other words there's a lot of energy being released and typically I say typically because nothing's for sure it will break in the prevalent direction of the trend and in this case right now, it is a corrective wave. So you can interpret that or extrapolate that in one of two ways. My sense is because after this, we go into what's called a impulse three. Um, it will break out hard to the upside once we conclude this particular wave two correction. Now, Gary, aside from the technicals, what are you seeing in terms of sentiment for gold and, and fundamentals because uh, i mean i i know some technicians they, they like to well at least myself i like to also look at those things of course technicals is my bread and butter but what um what, what are you seeing outside of the chart in terms of maybe market sentiment and fundamentals that sure sure let me let, third wave? yeah let me let me address that question in two ways and and start by talking about, I am a technician, I'm a staunch technician, but I consider myself to be a hybrid technician. In other words, it's absolutely a certainty that fundamentals move the markets, not numbers, not technicals. It is events in the world that create a liquidity in terms of the market changing in price. To me, the reason I use technicals is because math is a language that's much easier for me to understand. And, and all technicals are, are a distillation of the fundamental data coming out and it is converted into numbers. Now, one of my mentors is a, uh, a trader and teacher named Larry Williams. I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard of him. And I was on tour with him, um, this is back in the 90s, and financial symposiums were done by Wall Street Journal and they were a three month tour that we would go around the world. And I remember sitting one day drinking a cup of coffee with him and he goes, you know, you're a technician, but I want you to realize one thing. I said, well, what's that? He says, as a technician, you're standing on the back of the boat. You're looking at the wake and the waves that the propeller has, and you're trying to determine where the market is going to go based on past history. In other words, based on the wake and the waves that you see behind the boat. He says, but never forget this one thing. And I go, what's that, Larry? He says, only the captain knows when he's going to turn the wheel. And that's why fundamentals are important. In other words, fundamentals are, are, are those pivot points. Now, how do I feel? I've been a gold bull since about two thousand mid-2008. I started the, the service in 2009 because I felt there was going to be a tremendous breakout in the gold market. The bottom line is this. As long as governments print money that, that is not backed by something tangible, in other words, a fiat money system, gold really has nowhere to go but up. It cannot go down when, it's, when it is a benchmark against currencies and those currencies are being diluted. The best way to look at it, in my opinion, is that gold has never really changed in value or price through the ages. And it's the relationship to other currencies that has changed. So that one example I've been told is that back in the 1800s, 
if you had a one ounce $20 gold piece, you had $20, but that was a $20 gold piece, you could go into any town, get yourself a steak dinner, buy a fine suit, and stay in one of the nicer hotels for the night, and you could do that with one ounce of gold or a $20 gold piece. Now, in today's date, you've got gold at $1,700. You can take that $1,700, pretty much go to any city, have a nice steak dinner, buy a suit, and have a place to stay. In other words, that one ounce of gold's value never changed. The currency did. And so, fundamentally, we've got all kinds of issues, whether you want to talk about the fact that the European Union, there's a, there's a sovereign debt crisis, or not so much the fiscal cliff, but this incredible um, deficit that we've been building in America, you know, in, in the trillions. The bottom line is that as long as monetary policies of sovereign nations are based upon an economic principle that monetary stimulus is okay when it's not backed, gold can really go nowhere but up as it relates to those currencies. Okay, so you touched on the fundamental side. Are, are you seeing uh, anything uh, on the sentiment side in, in the, to impact your near-term analysis? Well, you know, I, I, here's, here's my approach. My approach has always been that I have a fundamental bias of market direction, okay? And my fundamental bias of market direction is up. But a market that goes up, unless it's really going parabolic and we can see points in time where gold actually did, it's going to have a series of peaks and valleys. That's where market timing comes in. And market timing and technical analysis, particularly Elliott Wave, what you'll find is that there are times when the market will sell off when there's really no rhyme or reason fundamentally. Take this last sell-off because it's fresh in our minds. What changed in the economic environment within a day that caused the market from peak at, say, 1757 to now trail down about intraday $60? Was there any huge fundamental change? No. Okay, but the market did sell off. Now, I was able to predict the top, but it wasn't based on fundamental news. It was based upon a model that says that your counter B wave in an Elliott wave is going to go to 50 to 75% of that A wave. In other words, there, for an overall direction, I have a fundamental bias, but the markets are going to act independently of that, and they're going to act based upon what you're calling, and that's that sentiment. Now, what I simply do, I try to stay true to uh, my technical approach. So I don't really want to know a lot out there in terms of what other technicians are doing. But what I do want to be aware of is what I happen to call the triad or the quadrant of a couple of key buyers, whether it's Soros, Paul Tudor Jones, Gartman. There are a group of people that put significant dollars into gold. And they tend to be right more than they're wrong, especially Soros. If Soros is buying, he's usually saying nothing and he tells people that he's selling as he accumulates. Um, or it's reported uh, the, the previous quarter that he bought so much and that's when he's unloading. But I like to look at those players in terms of when they're accumulating and when they're not. And the other thing that I'll look at is what are the central banks doing? Are they net buyers of gold or are they selling gold? Because to me, those are the two indicators that give me real market sentiment. Okay, now let's, uh, since we've covered gold, let's uh, see if we can talk about silver. Do you have a silver chart? You can sure, I can there? bring one up. I just want to do one other thing. I kind of want to move this forward to, to, to give uh, your listeners an idea of where we're looking at this market to go before we kind of move out. And all I've done here is I've done some basic Elliott Wave forecasting and modeling. And what I'm saying is we had our, our, our first impulse, and that took us to this, uh, what, 17, no, this is our $1,800 peak. And then we come down on our correction. This correction, I believe, is going to take place in three parts. Let's say that it's a flat. Once we go to a flat, we're going to enter this long rally or what's called an impulse three. And an impulse three is going to be typically, it has to be at least 100% of A, but it's typically anywhere between 138 and 161%. And the reason...
reason we do that is one of the golden rules in Elliott Wave is that, simply put, wave three cannot be the smallest of the three impulse waves. So, based upon just a 100% move, I believe that we're going to see 1871 silver. In other words, we're going to breach this triple ceiling that we have at 1800, and we could do that uh, within the first quarter to the second quarter of next year. At that point, we'll enter some sort of a correction. I've simply put it as a 38% correction. That would take us back down. Of course, it could be much steeper. And our fifth wave, which is going to end a major bull run that started in 2008, could take us anywhere between 2000 and 2100. So that's what I'm looking at in terms of a overall forecast for the market in terms of gold. And we can now go to silver, but I did want to let your listeners get an idea of what we're looking at. Let me pull up a, uh, a silver chart and kind of insert this here. Well, let me, I'll just, uh, I'll just speak for a minute here while you bring up the silver chart. That, that, that gold forecast is definitely something I'm sure uh, our listeners would uh, be very excited if, if that plays out, uh, as, as would I and probably yourself. Now, turn, turning to silver, one thing I've noticed, Gary, looking at a monthly chart, $35 seems like a very important level. So my, uh, my opinion on that is if we break 35 in silver, uh, that that could, uh, that, that could lead to maybe something in the low or mid 40s. Is that something? Uh, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and enter. You want to look at a monthly. Let me go ahead and convert this into a monthly so we can kind of let your, um, well, that's all the data I'm going to get. Uh, let your viewers kind of visually see what you're talking about. Let's go ahead and line this up a little bit better. Okay. So, uh, once again, what were you saying now? Well, I was just speaking about silver, and one thing I've noticed, looking at a monthly chart of silver, it clarifies how critical $35 is, how it's been uh, such a key level over the past uh, couple of years, and that seems to me to be the... Uh, to be the key resistance going forward, and so if we if silver can take out 35 on a monthly closing basis, it seems to me that that would lead to uh, something in the the low or mid 40s. Well, yeah. If you take a look at this, this is this is 35 again. This is a uh, Henkin chart. We'll go convert it to a candlestick. But yeah, there's absolutely no doubt when you take a look at this market, you've got these series of highs and tops. You've absolutely got incredible resistance there. You've had one key time when it attempted to take that out. I believe this is at uh, that $38 high, and then it comes down to about $26 here. 35 is really critical. In terms of uh, different support levels, let me see if I can pull up a different chart for us where I've actually already keyed in those support levels. And it's going to, let me change it because this goes by screen itself. Hold on. And this is a straight candlestick format. So what we're looking at here is a daily chart. And the elements that we really want to look at is I've got one basic Fibonacci retracement in this chart. And this retracement, let me change the color here for one second. This retracement goes from $44, the secondary peak, down to $26, as you can see right here. When you do that, that $35 you speak of, oddly, is a exactly a 50%. Look at the top of these candles and look at uh, the 50% mark, right? So it's absolutely a critical area of resistance. Support, you can see that right here. This is at 23%, which is at 30.87. Now, for example, we went long at 31.20 on our last silver trade. We kept our stops at 32.85. And the reason I put them at 32.85 was this particular level was so critical. Now it's just breached that really for the first time today. The interesting thing is that gold has, I mean, silver has absolutely outperformed gold in terms of percentage gains. And it has done that now for two years in a row. 35 is critical, but there's actually going to be one other level that you want to take a look at. And let me go ahead and bring that up for your listeners. And that's the next level of resistance. If it breaks through 35, the next level is going to be 37. Now, 
it's not as though this stuff is magic, but you notice how I put that line in, the 61% retracement, and don't you find it quite interesting that the exact top right here happens to match that, this happens to match this, this matches here? Right. Um, the reason these techniques work, especially Fibonacci retracement, is a Fibonacci sequence is a sequence found in nature. It's, it's just the mathematical building block of everything we are, we see, we do. And so it's that sequence that taps into a natural pattern or cycle of all of human nature. And that's why these numbers work. But to answer your question directly, if it breaks above 35, your next level is going to be 37. And then there's one other level on top of that, which is your 78%. We can put that in. And that's going to be $40, $39.93. So what, in, in, in regards to gold, I believe you have a $2,100 target. Do you have a, uh, a, a, a target for silver, assuming uh, where silver would go if gold hits $2,100? Right. I, I do have some, some notions. And the first thing that, that we, we look at is that they do tend to run in tandem, but at di different times they track differently. Before we get to 2100 or before we get to 2000, we have to take out 1800. We have not done that. We have a triple top. That's our first area. If we take out 1800, we would be taking out 35 and 37 in silver. Probably the 35 point, this 3512. If we start striving and moving towards the record top, which is 1920 in gold, you're looking, I believe, at about $40 silver. Now that's at 1900. Um, I don't want to speculate past that because what I showed your listeners was a very long term forecast based on Elliott Wave, and it's one of many models that can unfold. So the, the key is, is that this is what could happen, not what will happen. There's many ways it can unfold, but to answer your question directly, eighteen hundred dollar uh, gold, you're going to be looking at you know thirty five to thirty seven. It's going as gold breaks through the various resistance areas that are Fibonacci based. Silver will break through those also. So for, I, I'm looking for forty dollar gold, if and when a forty dollar silver, if and when gold goes to uh, test the nineteen hundred area. Now, one of the questions might be, well, if it goes to the record high, wasn't the record high $50 in silver, and silver is outperforming gold, why wouldn't it go to 50 And my sentiment on that is that what we're witnessing in, in silver is we had such a drastic sell-off. When this market hit 50 in a, what was it, a one-week period, it went to, what, $32 right in here? Here we can, right. let's just... It went right to, uh, excuse me, yeah, it went to this 3820. You notice how these line up here. Um, it sold off so much harder that it's got a lot more ground to make up. And that's, that's my rationale for why if gold goes to new highs, we won't see silver go to new highs. It just came down so hard. When it corrected, it corrected 25%, and it, 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 it did so in, in the blink of an eye, and then went to $26, which is pretty much... 50% from $50. I mean, even though it started at 8 and 10 and 12, it's a phenomenal move to the downside in the way that we had a phenomenal move to the upside. So uh, you, you, didn't, you didn't want to give a target assuming gold hits 2100 for silver, but I mean, to me, looking at the chart, it seems like if we see gold go, go above 2000, that silver would uh, ha have a chance to at least retest $49, 50 I, I would agree. And I really, my long-term projection for silver out, say, the next two years is going to be 55, 60. It's, it's going to not only take out that 50 at some point, but it's going to start to move to that mid-area, 60 or $70 per ounce. The one thing that we have to realize about silver is it has an industrial component that gold doesn't have. So depending on how the global economy is moving. If, if it's rapidly expanding, copper and silver are going to really be uh, beneficiaries to that along with platinum, or excuse me, palladium and platinum. 
the white metals will outperform during really, really strong economic growth. So it's going to be contingent on when we see this move in gold, if we have an economic slowdown uh, and, and, and a um, contracting global GDP, we are going to see silver react a little bit more sluggishly. If we have an expanding global economy in terms of the, um, the output, then you're going to see a greater need for silver and the precious white metals. Right. Now, um, hey Gary, looking at other things, uh, do you do any intermarket analysis just to get a read on what the rest of commodities are doing or what bonds and the stock market are doing? Do you have any comments on those and, and how they potentially uh, could impact or confirm your forecast for well, precious metals? I mean, well, absolutely. I would be an ostrich with my head in the sand if I didn't look at other commodities and all the factors that go into a pricing structure on a free market. Um, you know, oil obviously has an effect when you see oil go up you typically see gold go up because it's perceived to be inflationary. Um, in the same way we look at bonds because bonds are going to have a, an opposite effect. And the stock market really runs independently, but it gives us an idea of uh, GDP. It gives us an idea of an expansion or, or a contracting economy. So all of these things in this global marketplace are interconnected. But I believe that there's many moves in a market that cannot be explained by pure fundamentals. They're technically driven. And for example, this recent sell-off, they're all stating, you know, this is a technically based uh, sell in the market. And so there are certain areas that you're just going to get activity that's basically what we'll call market sentiment, meaning trader-based, and certain things that are fundamentally based as pivots or the impetus that breaks the inertia from one, one price point to the next. Right. Now, Gary, before we close, uh, could you tell our listeners about the work you do, your premium service, and, and how they can subscribe? Sure, sure. I started a, a daily video and email newsletter called The Gold Forecast, thegoldforecast.com. I have been a trader and market technician uh, since really the, the later 80s. I was first uh, became a broker in 1983. So... I've done that for a while. I was a systems developer in that I studied Japanese candlesticks very aggressively at a, at, a, at a time when they were just becoming known in the West, created a software program called the Candlestick Forecaster. And that was uh, on the market for many, many years. And it was uh, internationally recognized as the first software application to use artificial intelligence and identify these particular patterns. Really what, the, really what this program was doing was mimicking uh, what I was thinking. I had, uh, my partner was a programmer, I was the analyst, and we wrote a series of rule-based uh, logic that would try to mimic it. And the problem that I ran into is I could always outperform the program because I would bring in other variables. I, I, there, there was a, uh, an intricacy that we couldn't duplicate in a computer. And back in 2009, I felt really, really compelled to start a service up because I believed in my heart, with all of my heart, that gold was going to go parabolic. It was going to take off like a banshee. And so I started a service that looked at nothing but gold. But then we saw silver and it began to perform and outperform gold. And I felt that that's another opportunity we kind of want to bring in the mix. For those that are interested, I offer a free trial. You simply go to thegoldforecast.com. Sign up for the free trial. See if it suits you. If it does, we'll welcome you aboard. If not, you got exposed to a, a technical approach. Well, all right, Gary, on that note, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it, and I uh, look forward to having you back in the next couple weeks. My pleasure. My pleasure, Jordan. You have a great day now.